afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So before we start, let us pray for the Advent prayer again, huh? Lord God, we adore you because you have come to us in the past. You have spoken to us in the law of Israel. You have challenged us in the words of the prophets. You have shown us in Jesus what you are really like. Lord God, we adore you because you still come to us now. You come to us through other people and their love and concern for us. You come to us through men and women who need our help. You come to us as we worship you with your people. Lord God, we adore you because you will come to us at the end. You will be with us at the hour of our death. You will still reign supreme when all human institutions fail. You will still be God when our history has run its course. We welcome you, the God who comes, come to us now in the power of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon again. Let us welcome Dr. Philip. Hi, good afternoon. Um, we'll start right now. I don't believe I, I think I know most of you already. And so we'll begin today's talk. Uh, let me just screen, let me just share my screen. Okay, I think you can see my slides now. Yes, yes, dog, we can see. Okay. So good good afternoon, everyone. A uh, very very uh, suitable topic considering this the season of Christmas parties and family gatherings. So today's lecture is going to be called TCM Tips for Better Digestion, but I've nicknamed it the Pot and the Fire for reasons that you will uh, discover later. This is not meant to be comprehensive. It's impossible to fit this entire topic into one hour only. So if it leads uh, in keeping with the food theme, think of it as an as an appetizer or one of those samplers, you know, where you have a sample of each of the products. So we can have maybe future webinars on specific topics such as the kinds of foods, the flavors of foods. Uh, but uh, enough of that for now. So let's get it on. Oh, wait. Okay, what's wrong with my slide? I can't. There. So the Chinese word for digestive system is xiao hua xi tong. The term, I, I like to talk about the characters because it gives us insight into the concepts behind the words. So xi tong here just can just be translated as system. But let's take a look at the two words that describe the, the word digestion. So the first one, xiao, means to disperse and normally we associate dispersion in Chinese medicine with the lungs so what do we mean by dispersion here and the second word kwa means to transform so when you hear words in Chinese medicine like transform phlegm okay the spleen transforms phlegm this is the word that we're using what now basically what is being dispersed here what's being transformed here so this is a summary of how uh, Chinese medicine looks at the process of digestion. So please note that the ancient people, they are not aware of uh, histology or very, very detailed anatomy or analysis of enzymes as we have them now because they did not have the proper scientific equipment. Instead, they made various observations from clinic and from everyday life. So the way they understood the digestion is first, we partake of the food and water or beverage or whatever, and it undergoes a process of transformation. 
this process of transformation is uh, akin to distillation, wherein you can see there's a separation of the clear and the turbid. More on that later. And once these clear and turbid are separated from each other, they are to be dispersed to where they're supposed to go. Okay. So what is, where are they supposed to go? What is the clear? What is the turbid? And then the next up is, where does this distillation take place? Okay. So you can see that this is where I got the title for our webinar, The Pot and the Fire. Because the way that the ancient doctors looked at it, the stomach is your iron pot, cooking pot, whatever. Well, you have the pot, it just contains the mashed food. But what do you need to really cook it? You need the fire or the heat source. And that is what is the, what the spleen is. And before we go on, I'd like to take this time, to op this opportunity to explain that you could say that this actual, the equivalent of this in Western medicine are the pancreatic enzymes and the, the acids inside the stomach. But in ancient Chinese medicine, they did not recognize the pancreas, probably because by the time they opened up cadavers for examination, the pa it was a long time since they were buried, and the pancreas leftover enzymes digested whatever was left of the pancreas. So all they saw was a blob of digested tissue. But why did they associate the spleen and the stomach as partners? Well, on the one side, you see the liver and gallbladder together. And on the other side, you see the spleen and stomach together. So they assumed that that organ was in charge of digestion. Now, we, we know that that's not true in a modern Western medicine sense. However, the clinical clues, the diagnostic patterns that we get from looking at this still holds. It makes sense. So when we say spleen in Chinese medicine, we refer to something different from the Western spleen. Let's keep that in mind. Okay? In Western medicine, you can live without your spleen. In Chinese medicine, the spleen and stomach together are so important that there's a whole school of Chinese medicine that developed out of it. The spleen is also the distillation mechanism. So this is the transformation part, separating the clear from the turbid. If you remember, uh, when we distill something, up here is where we have the, the initial substance that we want to separate. In this case, the separation is due to the different boiling points. So some will evaporate faster, go up here, and then we'll condense here. You have a more pure substance here. So that's what they mean by the pure and the turbid. So what's here will be what you want, the pure stuff. And what's here, what's left is what you don't want, the turbid or the dirty. I'd also like to take note of the terms that the ancient Chinese used for rotting for digestion. Uh, when we studied acupuncture or Chinese herbal medicine, the terms we use to describe what the stomach does is rotting and ripening. So a lot of people ask me, what, what do you mean rotting? In the Filipino, we're saying nabubulok. It turns into something we don't want. And ripening, what do you mean? How can you rot something and ripen something at the same time? Well, the clue there is to look at the Chinese characters behind it. So the term that they use for rotting, that we translate as rotting, the term that means uh, to rot, to putrefy, or to decompose, um, is the word pu, which is the combination of this word above pu. The same pu as in zhang pu, so it's like a government official that processes things. And what's this word below here? Meat. So it's like what you get from processing meat. So a better word, a better, another word that we can use in English is to ferment. That's why I chose this picture. What do you, do, do you does anyone in the audience knows what they're doing here? Imagine this is your stomach and this is the food that's a quote unquote rotting. What's going on here? Anybody recognize this?
That is actually a fermentation vat where the people would ferment stuff inside to create wine. So this is actually the creation of fermented rice. Okay. Next up is the word uh, What is also uh, translated as ripening. It, it's also the word for cook. So um, if you were to analyze this character, this these four lines at the bottom are referring to the fire at the bottom. Well, this one is what we used to translate as still or pellet. And this one, and you, see the, you see the word for mouth, so to enjoy. You needed to enjoy the food or the little pellets of food. So you could actually say that what happens inside the stomach are two processes. We, the, the books will say rotting and ripening, but I think we can also use the words based on the ancient, based on the Chinese terms, to ferment or to pickle and to cook. Okay. So therefore, what are the next of that? What's the next thing we have to understand? As I said, we look at the concept of the clear and the turbid. Again, it helps to analyze the Chinese character. What this part on the left, the radical, that means we are referring to water. Okay? And oh wait, I better. So this one refers to water. This one, uh, long story short, is the word that, um, okay, in ancient, cult in many ancient cultures, the first words, the first names, the first colors that were given names were usually yellow, red, or brown, and, and green. In many cultures, blue came later. Why? Because in depends well depending like in greek culture the word cyan c-y-a-n and the word king here means a sort of mix between blue and green so you can imagine water that's blue and green see how clear that is except for the watermark to show where i stole the graphic from it's so clear so you can see why blue green is associated together they're considered different shades of each other uh, for those who know Chinese herbal formulas or Chinese astrology, that's why when we say Qinglong, it's usually translated it as blue-green dragon. Not blue dragon, not green dragon, but blue-green dragon. So we see that the concept of clear, pure, you can see what's, uh, it's already been distilled. Every, all the impurities removed. But let's look at the word that's, that we mean for turbid. Again, water, but this character here usually refers to worms or insects. So you can imagine brackish, dirty water that's full of wrigglers and things like that. Uh, this word is actually tuo. I had to look it up, sorry. <laughs> so you can imagine at the end of the process of digestion, you're supposed to have two things. This clear water or this clear substance and then this dirty substance. So where does the this so that's the transformation part? Where does the dispersion part come in? The spleen's job, okay, is to take that pure part and send it to the if it's from the food, send it to the lungs where it's supposed to combine with the blood, provide nutrition, while the liquids go to the heart, okay, where it's supposed to help form blood. So the term we have there in Chinese is uh, sheng qing, meaning to raise the pure or upbearing the clear. So sometimes in disease, that's not going to go up. The clear is not going to go up. The spleen function is bad. That's why it accumulates here. People become lightheaded. Uh, their eyes become blurry because of the lack of the clear bringing up. And then they have bloatedness here because it's, it's supposed to go up, but it's getting stuck here. So remember, so whenever you see 
uh, acupuncture points or herbs that have references to up bearing the clear or raising the clear. This is what we're talking about. Bringing the important part or the things that we need from the food that we eat out. So the pure part of foods become the basis of creation of chi in the lungs. In other words, chi here referring to the energy from which the, the organs get the power to do their functions. The fuel, the gasoline. Okay? Since the lungs are the master of chi, they'll take the chi from the grains we eat and the chi from the air we breathe, put it together, then you have your nutritive and defensive chi. Well, the pure part of liquids becomes the basis for creation of blood in the heart. So you can see how important the spleen is in this sense. Because if the spleen function is poor, not only is the process of separation poor, but whatever you, you digest, it doesn't go to the proper place. So even if you eat right or try to eat right, you don't get the full benefit from what you eat. So it's very, very important to take care of the spleen. As I said, there's a whole school of thought, a whole style of Chinese herbal medicine based on taking care of the spleen and stomach. Now, what about the dirty one, the turbid? The stomach is the one that sends it down. Okay? So for those of you who have studied Chinese medicine theory, remember, the spleen, she goes up, stomach, she goes down. So what happens, just imagine, if... The stomach she does not go down, but it goes up. That's why you have vomiting, nausea, retching. So when you see acupuncture points talking about correcting the flow of chi of the stomach or rectifying the stomach, that's what we're talking about, helping bring it down. So the solid parts, the solid impurity, the solid dirt goes to the large intestine while the liquid goes to the small intestine. Now, this is, not, um, this is not very accurate in terms of Western medicine, but, it's, but you can see that the general idea is there. The general idea of separation of the pure and the dirty, and then the dirty. There's a different organ managing the liquid part and the solid part. Of course, we're referring to the kidneys and the intestines. So this uh, turbid part is called jiang tuo. So again, the word tuo. Now the large intestine, again, I find this very, very interesting. It reabsorbs what, if there's still any good stuff in the impure solid, in the dirty solid, it will reabsorb. What does this sound like? Remember that in, even in Western medicine, we know that the large intestine reabsorbs, li reabsorbs liquid from the stool so that when it comes out, it's just right. Well, the small intestine here kind of uh, takes the role of the kidney in a sense in that they also regulate the fluid before it becomes urine. Okay. That doesn't mean that the, the physical urine it's coming from the small intestine. It just means that the small intestine is in charge of that. But the actual process takes place in the lower burner. Okay? So now we... Let's look again at the functions of the spleen. They can be summarized in two words. That's the words transportation and transformation. We memorize that all the time in Chinese medicine. But what do they really mean? So let's look at the, again, the characters. Hua, we've encountered before. That's the start. Again, related to digestion, except the word yin for movement here, it's more than just to disperse. It's also to actively move something. So to do exercises, uh, similar word, yin tong, here, yin hua, move everything actively and then transform it, the separation part. Now let's look at the weaknesses of this system. How do we screw this up? How do we 
give ourselves, make ourselves sick. Well, there are two sayings in Chinese medicine. One is, the stomach doesn't like dryness. How to remember this? What do you think happened here in this picture? I'm sure you can see the picture. What, what happened there? Any idea? What happened here is, uh, there was a, what happened here is somebody did not, somebody cooked with too little oil or too little liquid. So you have some bits and pieces of food that burned and that's now sticking here. So imagine that, that if there's too much fire, consumes the stomach in, you start having leftover food stuck in the stomach. Now, let me ask you, how hard is it to cook in a pot like this? It's almost impossible. So you can imagine if you have a patient with accumulated food in the stomach, until you get rid of that accumulation, they'll be forever have indigestion, they'll forever be have poor digestion. And it will also get burned. So these patients with the stomach dryness and heat, their breath will smell really bad. And it's not coming from the mouth. It's coming from, from inside. So that's the stomach, doesn't like dryness. But what about the spleen? Take note of this word, dampness. How fitting because where I am right now, it's kind of rainy. I don't know if it's raining where you are. But that, that concept, the spleen is averse to dampness. So I'm showing you a picture of some soup being cooked in a pot. What do you, now if I ask you, think, okay, what if we put ice cubes here, or we put cold water into that? What do you think is going to happen? You just ruin the cooking. What happens if you put water here, put out the fire? You also ruin the cooking. So that's why the, this part, the spleen doesn't like dampness. And yet, I am forced to ask this question. Okay, it makes sense. So why do we love, why do many people love drinking water, ice water while eating? Because that's exactly what we're doing. We're, put, we're introducing more dampness here. And dampness is not just literal water. It's, sorry, it's also referring to certain the effects of certain foods, but more on that in a while. So what are the implications of what I just talked about? The implication is this, and the concept that I want everyone to learn is this. The idea of cooking is not just to make the food taste better or to make it, uh, you know, combine ingredients together. It's also to start pre-digesting the, the foods we eat outside the body to make it easier to digest inside the body. So let's look at the processes that we do with our digestive system. We did not even count the entry, the teeth. We take the food, we chew it, we masticate it. Why? We're chopping the ingredients, we're mashing it together, and then that's when we cook it in the stomach pot. So to save ourselves the trouble, let's do it outside. We chop the ingredients outside, we put it in the cooking pot outside. So when we take the food, less work for our body. That is how we, you know, Chinese medicine looks at digestion. It's a continuation of the process of, or rather, cooking outside the body is a precursor to the process going inside. I mean, have you guys ever tried eating raw meat? Just that cutting part is really difficult. So the consequence of that is foods that are physically cold and foods that are not uh, cooked prop, not cooked as well, they require more energy. So even if you extract energy from digesting it, we use up more energy in digesting it. So Think of it as think of it as buying so buying ten million pesos worth of 
raffle tickets to win a 9 million peso prize. Sure, you won the prize, but how much did you spend to win it? You actually have a net loss. But Chinese medicine doesn't really doesn't like foods that are overly cold or foods that are not uh, cooked all the way. Now, before anything else, people are going to say, but what about sushi? Sushi is never totally raw. It's still lightly cooked. What about Vietnamese pho or pho? What about Vietnamese pho? Yes, they put those slices of, but look, the, the beef is there, but it's thinly sliced. Yeah, they put it raw there, but it's thinly sliced. So when you put the soup, the hot soup of the pho, it cooks the beef. So it's never actually totally raw. Even salad. Yes, even Chinese have salad. But what do they put it in? Vinegar. What do we use vinegar for? For fermentation. So remember the two parts, fermentation and cooking. So that's why, uh, I think that's why if we talk about sushi, yes, the food is, the fish is undercooked, slightly raw, but what do you eat it with? Vinegar rice, because the vinegar helps to, helps to digest it also. Now, a lot of people will say raw foods may have more nutrients. When you cook the raw food, you, they lose some of the nutrients. But as I can, the process to extract them requires more energy. You need to turn up the heat because it's physically cold. So you have a net loss, at least in the TCM perspective. Just think about it. When we have, when we have children, when we have babies, do we give them? Do we give them a nice, uh, a nice T-bone steak? As much as I enjoy T-bone steaks, no. What do we feed the baby? We feed them food that has been pre-cut, pre-mashed, and heated, warm, so it's easy to digest. Even in Western culture, when people are sick, what kind of foods are traditionally given to them? Remember, they say for chicken soup, for example, yeah, soup, again, warm, nutrients easy to absorb, because we, they know that the body is not as good as normal. Even in every day, in uh, every part of the world, a lot of multi-course meals are, they start with what? Sorry. They start with soups. So, not only are cold foods harder to digest, but cold is everyone knows that heat makes things move and uh, cold slows things down. Remember the picture I showed you earlier of the distillation equipment? What was the thing? What was the source of the fire? The Bunsen burner. So in chemistry labs, I know because recently I had to help my daughter with an experiment. They used a lot of. Uh, they always have Bunsen burners. Why? Because heat speeds up chemical processes. Cold. Why do we put food in the refrigerator to slow down decomposition? by germs, right? So that they don't rot. They don't become bad. They don't spoil. So remember all that food that I said was already stuck? Imagine if that food is combined with cold, then you have sugar or stagnant food. And then the dampness and turbidity, they'll become worse. So. What? So the cold in itself will slow down digestion and it will cause accumulation of stagnant food. So what happens if there's too much accumulation of stagnant food? I'll show you a picture. You tell me what's happening here. 
You, you guys know what's happening here? It's a grease fire. All the fatty stuff in the pan, there's too much of it. It caught fire and ignited. So all that one, you eat all that cold food, you slow down your digestion, you destroy your digestion, it can give rise to heat. What kind of heat? The same heat that eventually okay, forms phlegm or makes you hungry. So your stomach becomes chronically overheated. You're always hungry. Then you eat more of your bad diet. And then you become even more hungry again. So it's just a vicious cycle that we have to break. That's why a lot of the Chinese herbal formulas for promoting digestion all involve promoting movement in the, in the, in, through the intestines. They, some of them involve breaking down this food stagnation. So they are going to go to the bathroom, get that stuff out. And then you have to strengthen the skin. So that's why a lot of people, so when some other people, they, they feel chronically hungry. And then they, even if they eat, there's still fire there, too much fire. So they want, they feel like they need to eat more in order to put out the fire. So they end up eating too much. So the overheating, overeating by itself will beget stagnant food, which then begets stomach heat, which then reinforces the overeating. It doesn't stop until we break the cycle. Now about dampness. Dampness will accumulate in the spleen, mixing with that stagnant food. So think about it. What do you get when you get that dirt and you mix it with water? You get mud. So that's what phlegm can be. That's what we can. That's what we can say phlegm is. Think of phlegm as a kind of mud that makes everything dirty. That when it solidifies, it can block things, so it clogs everything. You see, the word pan or phlegm. The word phlegm uh, means more than just the phlegm that we think of in Western medicine. When we think of phlegm in Western culture, we just think of that stuff that we. <clears throat> clear our throat or cough and spit out. But the concept of phlegm in Chinese medicine is anything that's sticky, anything that clogs. So imagine this from a Western medicine point of view. You eat the wrong foods, and then you get atherosclerotic plaques, and you get a heart attack. The phlegm there is the formation of that atherosclerotic plaque that blocks your blood vessel. So it's also a nice way of saying, so we're eating wrong leads to heart disease. What other, what, that's one way. Let's look at diabetes. What are the other symptoms of diabetes? Patient feels that their hand, that their feet are numb. Poor circulation. Again, phlegm clogging everything up. The dampness causes that. So can you imagine your blood vessels starting to look like this. All that phlegm, all that mud, all that grease made worse by the heat and bubbling so they all lump together, blocking everything. Blocks your digestion, blocks your thinking, blocks your blood flow, everything. That's what it, it, that's what it looks like. And you know what's crazy? I've seen patients that when you this was even before I studied Chinese medicine. I just draw their blood for a blood examination. I sometimes see a patient with clumps of fatty stuff in their blood. It looks like this. Like what? You can imagine what kind of diet they must have combined with other habits like smoking, introducing more fire, right? So another implication of this is dampening foods. Now. I'm sorry, there seems to be a fire truck passing by. We'll let that pass first. Okay, so dampening foods. There are some foods. Again, if I were to explain this, we're going to go all five element theory. So I'll just stick to say foods that are excessively sweet 
can generate this tap or foods that are excessively sweet in flavor they can interrupt they they, they serve to strain the stomach they serve, they make it makes it harder to digest in the short run we have more energy but in the long run it's harder to process so these are examples of food that you need but you should not take too much of so milk very dampening butter very dampening eggs very dampening especially if you deep fry them oils seeds we need them but too much is bad nuts too much because they're fatty too much is bad sugar molasses and honey they're good for you but too much is bad and this is the number one cause in my opinion of modern heart disease in the united states they don't even use sugar anymore they try to make it cheap by using high fructose corn syrup. So they concentrate all that sweet corn syrup. It's too dense that the calories are too high. That's why, here's a tip. I love Worcestershire sauce, but I always check if the Worcestershire sauce is made in the UK or made in the US. Because if it's made in the UK, they make it with molasses. If it's made in the US, they make it with corn syrup. So no. Most fruits, if you eat too much, you eat too much of, of the fruit, it's also bad because they're too sweet. Also with wheat and buckwheat, any grain, too much. So you get the idea. Let's go to the example of these diets where they try to reduce the amount of carbs. So you rely on oils and seeds. In the, in the short run, yes, you can lose some weight. But in the long run, you're still... Uh, promoting a process that's not natural. So I've seen people who have gotten gout when they do the ketogenic diet like that. So, so sorry. So number one, uh, really, really try to get foods that are more neutral. And I forgot to put the slide, I'm sorry. One major consequence of this is that in Chinese medicine, they really frown on food juices. Now, I know many, many alternative medicine practitioners, they emphasize juicing. And let me ask you, if I were to ask you here and now to eat three full oranges at once, you look at me and think I'm crazy, right? Three whole oranges all at once. Well, that's how much orange you need to get a little bit of juice. So, in my opinion, there are some people who are really nutrient deficient, Yes, they need concentrated juice of the fruit. But in, if, in, if you're already healthy, why not just eat the whole fruit? You get the right amount. You get the amount of sugar that God intended. And then you also get the fiber. Right? So Chinese medicine thinks that the worst thing you can give to children, and this is very common, is what? Fruit juices that are number one, too much concentrated foods. Number two, probably has added corn syrup. And number three, is usually given to children, let's see, warm or cold? Cold. Absolute disaster. Now, I'm going to humble brag a little bit. Um, I remember a story before. Uh, I brought my daughter, who was then two years old, to a birthday party where my the birthday celebrant was the was the daughter, was the granddaughter of my ninang. So my ninang, my godmother, told me, "Hey, your mother is telling everyone that I'm a cruel dad because I don't let my two-year-old daughter eat ice cream." I said, I, "It's not that I don't want her to eat ice cream. That let her try some." So my ninang got the ice cream. And I found out, oh no, Hagen does. So I tried giving my daughter, two year old daughter, Hagen does chocolate ice cream. You know what my daughter did? She tried it and she spat it out. She said, I, no, too cold. See? She's the one who doesn't like the cold because I never trained her to like cold foods. I never let her get used to cold to uh, sweet foods. When she was older, 
she actually I started letting her choose items from the menu. We were in a ramen place. She orders the vegetable ramen. You can tell what she's used to eating. Uh, so please, children, their spleen and stomach are still weak. Don't abuse it by giving them foods that are too cold or too sweet. It's a recipe for disaster. You want to know a good example? Look at me. I've struggled with weight all my life. Why? Because since I was a child, I discovered my food were all wrong. One more thing also that I don't like about uh, the Western diet. Uh, I mean, in Western medicine, my daughter's pediatrician, they always says that my daughter is too thin for her height, too, too, too light, not heavy enough. You know, they, they have this height and weight graph. My daughter's always at the, at the bottom end of the graph because she's thin. So what would some Western pediatricians do? Oh, have your daughter eat more food, pattern them up so it will go up in the middle of the graph. I said, no, the ultimate, the, ultimate, the ultimate judgment is, is she doing well socially in school? I'm going to brag now. So she's a first valedictorian in grade school and running for valedictorian in high school. So yeah, I think, she, I think we did something right. And she's still and she's still too thin for her height. <laughs> so important to, why is it important to preserve the spleen and stomach? What emotion or oh, TCM students, what emotion is connected to the to the what aspect of the mind is connected to the spleen again? Thinking. Maybe that's why my daughter has a ridiculous memory. It's so easy for her to memorize things. Because from infancy, we took care of her spleen and stomach, okay? Now she'll sometimes eat ice cream, but she'll let it melt first. She really doesn't like it if it's too cold. <laughs> Next up, eating at irregular times means confusing the spleen. Let me ask you, who cook? Do you keep your stoves open the whole day? Of course not. That's stupid, right? You only turn your stoves off when you're going to cook. The problem is, if you eat at irregular times, your spleen doesn't know when to turn it on or off. That's why in Chinese medicine, there is a huge emphasis on eating at regular times. Because if you eat at regular times, your body already knows, oh, it's almost 12 noon. Time to preheat the cooking pot. Time to turn on the stove. Imagine... The stove is turned on, but you don't put food in it. It becomes dry. The water evaporates. Then you, have, you get sick. You put food there, there's no fire. So it becomes stagnant. So not eating at regular times ruins the whole pot and fire analogy. Okay? So here are the tips. I did not discuss the five elements of food anymore. That's too broad a topic. So I'll summarize it by saying, always eat a wide variety of foods to represent the different flavors. An example would be the Japanese bento box. Classically, a Japanese bento box should include foods of every color. So you might have some uh, black bean, some white vegetable, so on and so forth. Number two, always, of course, there are times where we can eat rich food. You know, our Noche Buena, our Christmas party. Let's enjoy. Let's celebrate. But for everyday eating, it's best to eat clear, light, easy to digest foods. That's why in my household, uh, most often our food is... Breakfast is usually porridge of grains. And other meals are usually stew or soup. Because they're clear, light easy to digest okay also sometimes we have cravings or addictions the problem with with addictions to certain flavors is we therefore overdose on one kind of food and neglect the others always try to eat variety but so far i've been talking in general 
we also have to customize the diet to a particular person. So if, you're, if a person is overweight, we have to do some calorie counting, and then we have to, t and we have to find out why they're overweight and work on that. If people are trying to gain more muscle mass because they're exercising, their diet should also reflect that. If people have a constitution that's, there are some schools of Chinese medicine that teach that different uh, body physiques means that a certain element is predominant. So by that school of thought, my daughter is a fire element. So we have to make sure that she cannot have too heaty foods. Me, my, my body type is very damp. So I have to eat foods that drain damp and percolate damp. So more spongy vegetables, more of the upo, more of the uh, okra, that kind of food. More of the ampalaya to help leach out that dampness. Try to eat set time, set amount, so that your body can preserve energy by knowing when to turn the stove on and off. Proper cooking, self-explanatory. And number seven is a tip that may or may not be applicable to the Philippines because we basically have wet and dry seasons. So, but basically what it means is to adapt our diet to the environment. I, I can explain this by telling another story. I, I was talking to my brother-in-law. My wife's family is from Hunan province, which is known for spicy food. But it's nowhere near as spicy as Sichuan province, which is like the king of spicy food. My brother-in-law, who is not a doctor, he's an aeronautic engineer. We were having a conversation. He said, I said, in Nanjing, where I lived for a year, they don't eat much spicy food. And then in, in Sichuan, uh, in Hunan and Sichuan, they eat more spicy food. He said, because in Nanjing, it's not as cold. In Hunan, it's a little more... Ah, in, in Nanjing, it's damp compared to Beijing, but not as damp as in Hunan or Sichuan. So people in Hunan and Sichuan want to eat more spicy food to perspire to get the dampness out. But in Sichuan province, it's not just cold, it's damp also. So they eat even more spicy food to warm their body and to sweat. And I'm like, that kind of makes sense. So people say, how come in Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, they eat spicy food? It's already hot. I realized it's not so spicy but they're doing it because they want to get the dampness out. To get the dampness out. The problem is here in the Philippines, not only do we like our food sweet, we also like to deep fry a lot. So we're just, the weather is already damp and we're making things worse. But anyway, adapt the food to the season. Okay? So that's pretty much the end of my uh, talk.